Good morning. It's 9.30, so I think we need to get started. Um, hope everybody had a good weekend. And I want to start the lecture with uh, an announcement just for you to be aware that we are going to have our first exam in two weeks. So on the 27th, so make sure that you uh, are aware of that and start preparing accordingly. For the exam, we're gonna have a review session on Wednesday, the week before on Wednesday. Uh, and then the exam is gonna be on the 27th, which is a Monday. Uh, so you will have enough time to, to prepare after the review. And the exam is going to be in class and it's going to include until lecture four, the beginning of lecture four. So we're gonna do lecture three. We're gonna start lecture three this week. We're gonna complete lecture three this week as well. And then next week, we're gonna start on Monday lecture four. We're gonna cover some, um, a portion of that lecture and that will be the last material for the, for the exam. Um, so, in our previous lecture, we, we discussed the uh, formulation of two of, of programs or linear programs with two decision variables. Today, we are going to continue and also we'll discuss how to solve those type of problems, specifically those that have two decision variables and how the graphical method can, can be applied to solve those problems. Uh, we also discuss using the graphical method that there are uh, how to identify the different type of solutions. So we mentioned that in lecture one as well, that there it could be a single solution for a problem, could be multiple solutions for a problem, and there could be no solution for the problem. So we, we also talk about how to identify those cases using the graphical method. But as I mentioned already in this class, most of the models that we are going to formulate have more than two decision methods. So the idea with the formulation of those basic models was to get you into understanding the process. So now you have an idea how to formulate this, these problems, what are the things that you need to do, like identify the decision variables, formulate an objective function, and also formulate the constraints. And for problems that have two decision variables, now you know how to solve those. Uh, in this third lecture, we are uh, expanding that discussion. Now we are going to discuss problems that have more than two decision variables. And these are more practical problems. Um, these are most closely related to the type of problems that you will find in practice. Uh, so in this lecture, we're gonna talk, we're gonna extend our discussion on formulation of linear programming problems. And we're going to go and explain these uh, examples that are more practical in order to build that knowledge that you need to formulate these type of problems. Uh, but before we get into the examples, let's talk about the formulation of linear programming models of real life situations. So the agenda, as you can see in this list, I have different uh, applications that we are going to discuss in this lecture. Uh, we're gonna start with the guidelines for model formulation. And then we're gonna discuss the diet problem, which is a, a problem that is used frequently as the first example, gives you an idea of a specific type of constraints. And then we're gonna transition to what we call the production planning and inventory control. This is more, more closely related to what we are going to do as industrial engineers. And then this is for a single period, then we extend this model to a multi-period production planning and inventory control. So production planning and inventory control is looking at, okay, if you need to plan for next week, this is how the model should look like. But if you need to plan for, let's say three, four weeks, uh, your production schedule, then the multi-period production planning and inventory control model is, is the model that you will need to use. 
as industrial engineers, we do a lot of scheduling. So we're gonna talk about two specific examples. One is for bus scheduling, and the other one is for uh, scheduling uh, work shifts for the post office. And from there, we're gonna to transition to other applications like urban development planning, project selection. And the last one is a oil application, blending and refining. So that will be the last example for this lecture. Today, we're gonna to go until, hopefully until the manpower uh, planning uh, examples. And after that, you're gonna have a, a lab in which you're gonna to try to formulate a problem uh, which looks at manpower uh, planning in terms of scheduling. So let's talk about the guidelines for model formulation. Uh, formulation is like a chess game. If you have played chess, uh, you know the rules, but you know it's only with practice that you can get better. Uh, because you start understanding the different situations, you start understanding the different um, behaviors of your opponents, you start gathering data and you know how to use that information to make your next moves. So I can teach you the rules, review the star standard moves and discuss examples, but every game or every problem is going to be different and require some thought. However, if you start building this library, that, that's what we're gonna start doing today, this library of models with different applications, then you will see that when you face a problem, you can think about, okay, this looks like this problem that we discussed, or this looks like this problem that I saw in this textbook. And you can use that as a guideline to at least get started with the formulation for your problem. So apply what you know, does this new problem fit the standard structure? So for example, if this is a production planning problem, is the answer is yes, so I can go look at that production planning model and I can start with that. Um, so you will build a library of experience with a variety of problem types. And we're gonna start building that library today. Formulation process. So as I mentioned already, you start by identifying the variables. So what are the decisions that you have to make? Uh, and then identify and formulate the objective of the problem. Typically, this is in terms of maximization of profit or minimization of cost. Then you are going to identify the constraints in terms of what are the resources that are in limited supply. Those are the ones that are going to constrain my decisions. And then identify how the decision variables must be related in constraints and formulate those constraints. Constraint must be defined the feasible values of, of all decision variables. So remember, if you want those decision variables to be only positive, you have to set up these non-negative constraints, uh, making those decision variables less than or equal or greater or equal to zero, for instance. So those are the feasible values for all decision variables. Make dimensional analysis to make sure that the objective and each constraint are consistent. So there could be a way, uh, sometimes you can build your model and you end up having constraints that are overlapping in the sense that they are doing the same thing. So you want to build a model that is efficient in the sense of make it, it easier to solve. So if you have some constraints that are constraining, well, I'm using the same word. Uh, if, if you have a constraint that is overlapping, meaning that it's doing the same, it's cutting your solution space in the same way that the other constraint, they, you might not need that other constraint. Um, so making dimensional analysis to make sure that the objective and each constraint is consistent is important. Uh, formulation is an iterative process. So you should know that you might not get the model that you need the first time that you solve it, I mean, the, the first time that you formulate it. Meaning that you, you can get a formulation, um, you, you can try to solve it, you see that the solutions that you're not getting, that you're getting are not making much sense. So that means that you need to do some modification on your, on your model constraints most, most likely, or maybe you need to find another way to define your decision variables. Uh, so this is an iterative process until you get to the model that is doing what you want to do. 
So propose a reasonable definition of variables and begin model formulation. If you cannot incorporate all issues, you will have learn how to redefine, you will have to learn how to redefine the variables to do so. Uh, so again, the way that you define your decision variables are going to have an impact on how the model is gonna look like. Um, so make sure that you identify the right decisions. What are the things that you want to get from, from the model after you solve it and use that information to formulate your decision variables and from there, the objective function and the constraints. Mm -hmm. Yes. You will have to go through the process multiple times. That's what I mean. Yes, good question. So you start your formulation, you get to the formulation, you try to solve it, or you try to see if, if it is addressing all the issues that you want to address. If something is missing, you will have to go over the formulation one more time. You might need to redefine your decision variables or maybe reformulate some of the constraints. So let's talk about some uh, specific practical examples. Again, these are this, uh, uh, these are problems that requires the use of decision multiple decision variables, uh, more than two, uh, which were the problems that we studied at the beginning. Now we are extending this uh, explanation or this discussion to problems that are bigger and more practical. So uh, many LP models arise from situations in which a decision maker wants to minimize the cost of meeting certain requirements. Uh, so in this problem, we are looking at it from a perspective of a diet. Uh, so we have uh, Bob who wants to plan a nutritious diet, but he's on a limited budget. So he wants to spend as little money as possible. And he has some specific nutritional requirements that he needs to meet. Uh, so, for example, a 2,000 kilocalorie diet with 55 grams of protein and 800 milligrams of calcium. So these are the requirements that he wants to meet in terms of his diet. And he also has little money to make that happen. So he will look at different combination of food in order to see how he can meet this uh, constraints and in his case or these uh, goals with the limited budget available. So here's some information that he has available. So he is considering the following foods. And as you can see, there are six items here and each one of them has different information in terms of serving size, energy, kilocalories, protein, calcium, and also we have the price per serving. Okay, so as you can see, uh, for example, Pork and beans has uh, a cost, a higher price than oatmeal, but they have different, also different um, serving sizes, energy, protein, and calcium um, limitations. So this is information that we have. <clears throat> we have the price, obviously, if you're trying to, if we have a limited budget, we want to know, <clears throat> excuse me. We want to make sure that we take that into account. Um, so we have the information about the, the items, we have the information about the requirements, and we know the goal. He wants to minimize the, the cost of meeting these requirements. So the questions to be answered, we have how many servings of each type of food? So we have six options. He's considering these six options, obviously, if you were to formulate this yourself, you might have a different list of, of options here, or you might have an extended list. The problem is going to be the same. The only difference is that you're going to have different data, different data, okay? And you're gonna look at that data in order to solve the problem. But with the data that we have, which is this one, we want to formulate this problem. So how many servings of each type of food? So we had six different types of food here. So we're gonna use an index to identify each type of food. And our decision variables are going to be based on those different type of foods. So we want to know how many of each we should buy in order to meet these requirements. So we can represent the number of servings of each type of food in the diet by these six variables. Um, 
the number doesn't, I mean, you can use one for milk or you can use one for sherry pie. It doesn't matter as long as you're consistent when you name these decision variables to represent something. So X1 servings of oatmeal, X2 servings of chicken, X3 servings of eggs, X4 servings of meal, five cherry pie, six uh, pork and beans. So those are my decision variables. So at the end, I want to have a solution that is gonna tell me X1 equals this, X2 equals this, X4 and so on, equals this many servings. Okay, so I know what decisions I want to make. Now I have to look at what are my, what is my objective function, right? So my objective function is again, in this case associated with the limited budget. So I want to make sure that I meet these requirements, but I, I need to make sure that I don't spend more money than I need to. So that should tell you the type of objective function that we're gonna use in this case. So let's move forward. So we want to minimize the cost and we have the price per serving here in this last column. And we know the decision variables now, so we can associate each price to each decision variable. And that's what we are doing. We are multiplying the decision variable times the cost of each uh, item. And we are, we are doing the summation of all the items. And we want to make sure that once we make the decisions, this cost is the minimum, meeting those requirements that we are going to formulate in the constraints now. So you see how the objective function is associated to the cost or the price per serving here. So that's what you have as part of the uh, coefficients or the coefficients that are multiplied to each decision variable here. So 30 cents per oatmeal serving, that's why you have 0.3 times X1, $2.40 for each serving of chicken. So that's why your sum, the sum of 2.40 times X2 and so on. So we have the decision variables on the objective function now. The next thing is to formulate the constraints. So I have listed the decision variables now next to each one of the rows in the table. So just to keep you informed of what's going on, X1 through X6. So our decision variables are associated to each one of the items. So I want to make this requirements now, 2000 kilocalories, 55 grams of protein and 800 milligrams of calcium. So I'm going to formulate a constraint first for the first requirement, which is 2000 kilocalories. And as you can see now, I'm multiplying per item. I'm looking at the kilocalories now, the energy column. Now multiplying that, those coefficients times the decision variables associated with each product or each item, 110 times X1, 205 times X2, 160 times X3 and so on. I'm doing the summation of all that. And that has to be greater or equal to 2000, which is my requirement. That's the minimum that I want. So that's why I'm using greater or equal. That's the minimum number of calories that I want in my diet. So at least 2000. Do you want to make it you want to have at least 2,000 kilocalories. You don't want to go under that, right? So that's why you're making this constraint greater or equal. At the end, if you reach the 2,000, this constraint is going to be met. If you go above that, it's still met. But you, you, you will see that if you go above 2,000, is going to cost you more. So the problem is going to force the solution to stay at that bound, 2,000 calories. We make that equal to, and that was a good question that we have in the previous session. The reason that we are not making that equal to is because when you try to solve an equality constraint, or when you try to solve problems and you have equality constraints, the Solution space is very restrictive and it's very difficult to solve. 
because the solution has to be exactly equal to something. Here you provide some flexibility. So for instance, you might end up with a solution in which you are meeting the requirements, but you have a combination of items that is 2001 calories. Still meeting the requirements, just going above that, that's not going to make a difference for him. Um, but you can obtain a solution. So that's the reason we are using this uh, greater or equal to. Yes. The objective function? Yes. This is the objective function. Yes. So our decisions are going to be guided by this function. So this is the first constraint. And if we look at the 55 grams of protein, the process is the same. You are going to look at the protein now. You're going to multiply that those coefficients by each decision variable. So you have four times x1, 32 times x2, 13 plus uh, plus 13 x3, plus eight times x4, plus four times x5, plus 14 times x6. All of that has to be greater or equal to 55 grams. And then the last one, 800 milligrams of calcium mole. So you will look, you're going to look at the coefficients associated with each item. And the constraint is going to be 2 times x1 plus 12 times x2 plus 54 times x3, 285 times x4, 22x5 uh, plus 80 times x6. So the constraint, I mean, once you formulate one of them, the other two are going to be similar. The only difference is the coefficient. And that's what you're going to see in the next slide. So we are trying to meet these requirements using the information given by the servants that we are considering. So this is the formulation. Uh, you see those two constraints are the ones that I just mentioned. So it's still, you have the coefficients associated with, in this case, the protein. And this one is the one associated with the calcium. Okay, so you, the difference from this formulation and the ones that you saw before is that now you have multiple decision variables. Now in this case, you have six. Um, but you see that as you increase the list of options, like if you make that table, instead of six items, you make that, I don't know, 100 items. This problem will have 100 decision variables. We have 1,000 items. This problem will have 1,000 decision variables. Um, the number of constraints is not going to change. Like as you increase the number of items, you will see that your constraints are going to be longer because of the decision variables. Uh, but the the requirements are if, if they remain the same, you will have the same number of constraints. If you add more requirements, then the constraints are going to increase in terms of uh, the requirements that you need to, to meet. Okay, so again, I, I want to remind you that in this class, this particular lecture, we're gonna look at these applications, formulating those applications. Next lecture, we're gonna solve this. Okay, I'm gonna teach you how to solve these problems that I have more than two decision variables. And then the lecture after that, we're gonna use the computer to solve these problems. So you're gonna first understand how to formulate these problems. Then we're gonna learn how to solve those problems by hand. And then we're gonna learn how to solve those problems using the computer. Yes. Yes, if you, when, you, when we transition into the solution method, is called the simplex method. It uses the, the matrix uh, form to solve the problem. So we're gonna extract the data. We're gonna set up a table using the coefficients. And then we're gonna start manipulating that information using the linear algebra concepts for matrix and vectors. That's correct. No, from now on, no more graphical method. Those, the graphical method is just for problems that have only two decision variables. Now we are 
looking at problems that are more practical in the sense of being more close to reality, more decision variables. So for that, we need to use the simplex method and for big models, the computer, which applies the simplex method, obviously. Uh, but at, when you start solving those by hand, you will see why we need computers because it's just too much computation to do it by hand. Um, but you need to understand how the simplex method works because um, if you end up, for example, working for a company that does not provide certain computer packages, you might need to program the simplex method yourself. Uh, so that could be something that you, you might end up doing. So understanding how the method works is, is important. Um, so let's look at the other production planning and inventory control. This application is, again, closely related to what you're going to be doing in practice uh, as an industrial engineer. Um, so again, this could be associated, or the example is going to be associated to a specific type of product, but if you go work for other companies, the HEV, and you're looking at, I don't know, the uh, supplies for something, same problem, same formulation, you just have to fuse the data for that product, for those products that you're going to be uh, studying. So in this application, we are looking at preparation for winter season, clothing companies, manufacturing, park and goose, uh, overcoats, insulated pants, and gloves. All products are manufactured in four different departments. You have cutting, insulating, doing, packaging. Company has received firms, uh, firm orders for its products. The contract stipulates a penalty for undelivered items. Devise an optimal production plan for the company based on the following data. Okay, so when you, you're manufacturing, uh, you're producing products, typically you are working with uh, multiple customers, right? So you, you, your goal is to serve as many customers as possible, but you have a capacity in terms of your production. So typically these contracts will have a stipulation that if you don't meet the, the requirements for the customer, you will have a penalty. And that's what we are trying to, to illustrate with this unit penalty here. Uh, so this is the cost that you will not incur if you're able to deliver on time. But if you wait or if you uh, go above that time period that you have in the contract, you might end up paying a penalty. So you will, your income is going to be reduced. So obviously we want to avoid that. Um, but you have also a profit per unit, um, and then also you have the time unit requirements for producing each one of the of the product per department. So we have four departments here: cutting, insulating, sewing, packaging. You have the demand for the next period, and for per product and you have the time necessary for producing each type of product in the cutting, in the insulating, in the sewing, in the packaging. So 0.38 time units. In this case, this is hours. So 0.3 hours for this, 0.3 hours for goose, 0.25 for pants, and 0.15 for gloves. In total, this is how much time you have available for this department, 1,000 units, 1,000 hours. So we have the demand also per product. We have the unit profit and we have the penalty associated with it. Uh, so we want to use this information to find um, the right combination of products that you must produce for the next time period. So what are the questions to be answered? How many units of each type of product to produce that would maximize my profit, meaning that my income minus the cost. And then we have different type of products. So I'm using an index. Same thing that we did for the previous example, we have an index. Now it is representing something else. Um, in the previous example, it was representing the number of portions of items of each product that I was going to buy. 
Now this is the number of products per type that I'm going to produce. So we have X1 equals the number of parts of jackets, two loose jackets, three X3 pairs of pants, X4 number of pairs of gloves. So you start seeing the similarities, right? Decision variables, okay, we are, we are trying to decide how many of each, at this point, how many of each uh, products to produce. And the objective function, instead of minimizing the, the cost now, we are trying to maximize our profit. We have a information for the profit and the penalty, right? So we are gonna look at the difference associated with uh, both so we want to maximize the net profit defines that uh, the total profit minus the total penalty. So this is a total profit. For each product, we have a unit profit. In this case, $30 for parka jackets, 40 for goose, 20 for pants, and 10 for gloves. So our profit is associated with each one of the decision variables. So 30 times X1 plus 40 times X2 plus 20 times times x3 plus 10 times x4, the profit, and now the penalty. Um, I'm using a different decision variable in this case. Total penalty requires the use of a new variable as representing the shortage in demand for product J. Okay, so again, x1 is the number of items that I'm going to be producing for each uh, product. But I, in order to implement this penalty cost, I need to know how many I was unable to produce, which is going to be the difference between that demand and the number of units that I end up producing per product. Whatever that number is, if that number is zero, no penalty associated with that. If that number is greater than zero, that's is greater than zero, then I'm going to apply the penalty to that. So I want to make sure that those S1, S2, S3, S4 are as small as possible if they are not equal to zero. So the objective function is going to be equal to the summation of the profit times the decision variables associated with the number of units that I'm going to produce per product minus the summation of those penalties associated with the products that I was unable to produce, which again, is going to be equal to that demand minus the number of units that you end up producing per product. So we're going to see that in, in a minute uh, when we formulate the constraints. OK, so the first four constraints here are similar to what we saw on the previous example. We have a requirement. We have some information about the, the requirement need. And we are multiplying that times each of the decision manual. So for example, if I'm looking at the cutting, I have a limitation in terms of capacity. So 1,000 units. So for the cutting department, I need to make sure that this parka jackets Time units required times the number of parka units that I'm going to produce plus 0.3, which is the requirement in terms of time for the goose jackets times X2, which is the number of units that I'm going to produce of that item, plus 0.25 times the number of units that I'm going to produce for those pants, points times 15 plus the number, times the number of units produced by four gloves. All that summation in terms of the time for the cutting department has to be less than or equal to the 1,000 units of hours that I have. So that's my first constraint right here. I have to formulate that constraint for each one of the departments. So I do the same thing for the insulating. It's 0.25, the time units in terms of hours times X1, which are the number of parka jackets, plus 0.35 times X2, plus 0.30 times X3 plus 0.10, which is the requirement for gloves, times X4, which is the decision variable representing the gloves. Summation of those is what we have in the second constraint. It has to be less than or equal to 1,000. 
So I'm making sure that if I end up producing this many items for parka jackets, goose, pants, and gloves, when I look at the number for each one of them, and I, I plug in those numbers here, I need to make sure that I'm not using more than 1,000 hours for this cutting department. If that's the case, then that solution is not feasible. So whatever combination of X1, X2, and X3, and X4, when you plug, it, plug in those numbers here, it has to be less than or equal to 1,000. Same thing for the insulating, packaging, and uh, sewing, which is third sewing and packaging the fourth. So those, I mean, once you get the first one for each, for each department is going to follow the same format. Now we're gonna look at what I just uh, discussed in terms of this, implementing this, how do you find that number S1, S2, and S3, and S4? How do you find that uh, shortage in the demand? The shortage is, yes, go ahead. So yes, so, so the idea now is you want to get as close as possible to that demand, but the information that we have is showing that that might not be possible because you have a limitation in the capacity, right? So if you are not able to reach that demand, you should target that demand, but if you're not able to uh, reach that demand, then you're gonna be penalized for the number of units that you are not. Oh, uh, so producing. it'll be number of units per short. Yeah, short, exactly. So, and that's what we are trying to uh, represent with these constraints here. There will be no changes if you make more demand. If, so what's the question again? If you end up doing more than what you need? Um, so that would mean, so in this case, that would mean that if you do more than the demand, this is going to be negative, right? And that is not possible. So that scenario is not going to be possible. In this problem, we are targeting that demand, okay? So for this constraint, S1 plus S1, what it's trying to represent is, okay, if we are not able to reach that amount, let's say for the Parker jacket, we are end up only producing 700. Then because of the limitations that we have, then there's gonna be 100 units that are going to be short, short. And then we're gonna apply a penalty to that, okay? So what you will think, I mean, we are not gonna solve this. We're gonna solve it um, in one of the lectures that is coming. But for now, what I can tell you is, if you think about this, there's going to be a solution for this problem that is going to be trying to balance out these two costs. Um, you see for those, your penalty is very high um, when compared to the other one. So you have a penalty of 20. So most likely, and your profit is very high too. So most likely you're going to try to avoid having a penalty for this problem in terms of the solution. But remember that the solution is not gonna be only tied to this, but also how, how much of your resources are consumed by each product. So what this is trying to achieve, okay, I need to know how many I'm not going to be able to produce. I'm computing that information using this constraint. S4 is going to be whatever is not produced, I'm going to know because I need to make sure that I reach 800. So whatever I produce plus the shortage is gonna give me that number. Um, and then that's the formulation. We, we have uh, the non-negativity constraints. And the solution is gonna be based on this profit that is going to be the profit minus the penalty associated 
by each problem. If you compare against the, the first one, this will take you longer to solve because now you have more constraints. And um, actually you have less decision variables for what more, more constraints. Um, yeah, and it will depend on what you're comparing against. And this is a final formulation. Um, so it contains all the information that we just discussed. So again, this is a single period production model. In the next application, we have the multi-period production planning and inventory control. So in this case, we didn't talk about inventory and we didn't talk about keeping items in storage, which has also a cost because we were planning only for next week. So I'm producing now and I'm selling. Everything's gonna be gone by next week. This is not the case for multi-period. Um, so we have another application here. Uh, we have a manufacturing company that has a contract to deliver 100, 250, 190, 140, 220, 110 home windows over the next six months. Uh, so now we're looking at extended time period. Production costs, which includes labor, material, and utilities per window varies per period. And it's estimated to be $50, 45, 55, 48, 52, and 50 over the next six months. So that production cost is going to be changing according to the month that you're producing. The first month is 50, second month is 45, third month 55, 48, 50, and 52 and 50 over the next six months. So it's gonna be going up and down uh, during that time period. To take advantage of the fluctuation in manufacturing costs, the company can produce more windows than needed in a given month and hold the extra units for delivery in later months. This will incur a storage cost at the rate of $8 per window per month, assessed on the end of month inventory. So the question or what we want to uh, formulate is a linear program to determine the optimal production schedule. So what are the questions to be answered? How many units to produce per month? And we know that the cost is going to be changing. And how many units left in inventory per month? Okay, so if we want to take in advantage of these fluctuations, we can produce, let's say in the first month or the third month, or in the third month for the sixth month, uh, and then keep those units in the inventory. But there's a cost associated with each one of those uh, units that are kept in the inventory. Um, we're gonna use an index to represent the month of the year. And we're gonna have two types of decision variable, the number of units produced in month I and the inventory left, inventory units left at the end of month I. So we think about this, see if I have that picture here. Yes. We're gonna have, we think about, you know, how many of you have taken engineering economics? All of you, you think you remember those cash flow diagrams which you have enter, go on, yeah, move forward. Uh, so that's the type of diagram or representation that we can use to, to see how this is gonna work. Um, so the variables of the problems include the monthly production amount and the end of month inventory for months I1, two, three, four, five, and six. So we have these two decision variables associated with each month and the relationship between these variables and the monthly demand over the six month horizon is represented schematically. So for example, if we, if we assume that we start at time zero, our inventory is gonna be zero when we, when we get started. We make a decision here in terms of how many units we are going to produce and we know that out of those, we're gonna have to sell or send a hundred out for our customers. But if we decide to produce more than we need to, let's say more than a hundred in this case, 
we know that there's going to be I1 moving to the next time period. So if we produce, if X1 equals 120, 100 of them are going to be used, and then 20 are going to move to the next period as inventory. And then the next period is the same, same question. We have 20 now. How many are you going to produce in this time period? You know that you're going to use 250, but you can produce more. So whatever you end up producing, it will be moved to the next period. So I2 will go to three, period three. And then in three, I make a decision again, how many I'm going to produce. I'm going to use this much. Whatever is left is going to be moved as inventory. And we continue this process until we get to here. At this point, might not need this because I'm, I'm, I'm done uh, after the sixth period. So I end up producing whatever is needed for that period and I'm done. Okay, so this is the idea. And we're gonna use this information to formulate the constraints. So we know a inventory is gonna start zero, but from there, we're gonna be carrying some inventory for the next periods. So the objective function, we want to minimize the total cost of production and end of month inventory. So total production cost is going to be associated with the cost for that month. So X1, X2, X3, X4 represents the number of windows that you're going to produce in that month. And there's a production cost associated with it. And then we have an inventory shortage or storage, I'm sorry, storage cost, which is going to be whatever you're holding as inventory for, for time period is going to be associated with the cost of $8. I have an associated cost of $8. So the objective function is trying to minimize the total cost. So it's the cost of production plus the cost of holding the inventory. So remember, we have fluctuations in the cost. So in some instances, it's gonna be better for you, let's say maybe here, where the cost is very low, you might end up producing more than you need. But again, they have to find a balance because if you produce all you need here in the second period, and you wanna hold that to the last period, there's gonna be a cost associated with that. So it may, might end up being more expensive if you produce in X2 and you hold it to period six, for example. So finding that balance is what we are trying to do with this solution. Uh, how many do I need to produce in the second period so my cost is minimized? Um, or how many I need to keep in inventory from period two, so my cost is minimized. And you see there's a fluctuation here in the four period as well. So that gives you some flexibility in terms of your planning. So the constraints of the problem can be determined directly from the figure using the following balance equation. Beginning inventory plus the production amount minus the end inventory. This plus this, so inventory at the beginning plus the, the production minus the end inventory, that has to be equal to the demand. So you see here for each month, we have a constraint and the right-hand side for that is equal to the, the demand for that month. So again, in this problem, we have an, an equality again. Okay, we don't have an inequality, we have an, equal, an equality. The reason again is that inventory is giving you the flexibility that you need to find a solution because you know, if you just, uh, if you cannot meet this demand, whatever is the difference is going to be cashed off by this. Yes. So there's no limitation of how much, how many of the No. There's no limitation because if you go above 100, that's going to be associated to the inventory. You see? So that inventory is giving you that uh, bound, not bound, but uh, that cushion 
Like if you are not a hundred, you're gonna go above that. Everything is going to be associated to that decision metal, and it's going to be counted as an inventory. Uh, and you can see that for the first constraint, since we start with inventory equals zero, we don't have a nice zero there. Use a zero, but for the other ones, we have what's coming and what's left. Uh, so for example, here we, we have a production and whatever we don't use is going to be a inventory. But in the, yes. So in this one? Yes. Yes, after six, since we are looking at a six month production schedule, we don't have to carry inventory for the next period. So why is it because schedule after first month because something left? Second month. Why don't we just reduce the schedule with schedule? For for no Oh yeah. So so the 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 question is why don't we just produce based on the schedule? Why do we need the inventory? The the answer is because we are trying to take advantage of this changing cost. Okay. Where is it? Yes. So this cost is changing for production. So if that cost was the same, then you're right. It doesn't make any sense for you to do, uh, to carry inventory. But that cost is going up and down. So some instances, like when you have $45 for production costs, it might be cheaper for you to produce more. Yeah, and then keep them in the inventory because you're saving some, some money. Um, again, if you, increase your inventory, if your inventory becomes too high, there's a, also a cost associated with that. So you have to find that balance. And that's where we are, the solution, that's what the solution is gonna tell us. So, you know, in month two, you should produce as many or this many, and that will minimize your cost. Um, Can you the price information before? Yes, yeah, so we have that information beforehand. That's 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 what we have available at the time of formulating the, the problem. So that's why we want to know if you were if you're gonna keep some inventory, how much would that be from period to period? So in the first month, you have that I1 representing what's moving to period number two. But that when you go to period number two or month two, I want to show it up again because that's coming from the previous period. So you have that up on hand, whatever you produce is added to that. And then if you decide to produce more in that period, that goes to the inventory. And that's repeated until you get to this point. When you're using the inventory for five, you're producing, but in this case, since that's the last period for your schedule, you don't want to produce more than 110 because you are ending your production at that point for this quarter. So in that, in that country, we want to make sure that we we have, let's say we have 55 here. So the difference is what we're going to produce for the last period. Okay? And that's the constraint. Those are the constraints. So multi-period, again, I'm sorry. Yes, I didn't see you. Yeah. Uh, so for like Oh, yeah, so yeah, that's a very good question. So the way it's written here, you have a comma for I1 up to six and then comma I. So what this is trying to do is all of them have to be greater or equal to zero. Okay, so it's written different, but that's what it's trying to represent. That's a good question. So all of them have to be greater or equal to zero. Good question. Okay. So, yes. So, yeah, we're, we're in good timing. So let's start talking about uh, scheduling, manpower planning. So we talk about production, another type of application that is very common in industrial engineering is for scheduling. So I can talk about, for example, in my experience, 
uh, with the airport, making sure that I schedule enough uh, TSOs or travel officers in the checkpoint, or making sure that I schedule enough doctors for the hospital here in San Marcos. So making sure that I schedule enough trucks to move uh, items from food banks to uh, the agencies that uh, provide help to people in after hurricanes. So scheduling different applications, but again, very, very important for industrial engineering. So manpower planning, and then the applications in industry. Like if you have a production schedule, making sure that you have people covering all the machines for the production that you have planned, uh, making sure that you have enough supervisors for running all shifts and, and so on. So I also, I mean, when I was an undergrad, I did an internship for uh, the Department of Transportation in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And one of the problems that I was studying as an intern was this, like, when, how many buses do we need uh, for the demand that is planned for the week in the city? Um, and then we have some information like this. Um, so, so let's go through the process. Uh, we have a study here, studying the feasibility of introducing a mass transit bus system to reduce in-city driving. The study seeks to minimum uh, number of buses that can handle the transportation needs. The minimum number of buses needed fluctuated with time of the day. So the required number of buses could be approximated by constant values over uh, successfully four hour intervals. So you can see here in this graph, it's telling you early in the day, let's say at 12 a.m., not too many people are running or using the, the transportation system but then in the morning, you can see that how, in, how that increases, 4 a.m., 8 a.m. in the morning. And then after that, people are, are working, uh, people are in school, demand goes down, and then goes up again after in the afternoon for the peak hours. Then at night goes down again. So if you have no experience uh, using the buses or uh, trains, you know that's typical, like demand going up and down throughout the day. Yes. Same route, yeah, in the city, yeah. So good question. So you have certain routes planned and these number of buses are going to go through that route, uh, specific route for the day. Um, like here in the university, you have different uh, routes and you have number of buses associated with each route throughout the day. Uh, so to carry out the required daily maintenance, each bus can operate eight successive hours a day only. So after the hours, you have to set them aside, go through the maintenance, and then put them back into the system. So, so we have this information. Now we have this requirement just to make sure that after eight hours, those buses are going to maintenance. And we want to know if we have these requirements, how many buses to run every eight hours. Um, we have the requirements every four hours, but the buses will run for eight hours before they go to maintenance. So the question is to be answered, how many buses are needed per shift? Assuming that we have eight hour shift. Um, so we have I equals shift number, and the decision variables are XI equals the number of buses needed in shift I. So the variables of the model are the number of buses needed at each shift. So here we have different uh, or all the possible shifts that we can create based on the eight hour limitation. So for example, if we started a shift at 12 uh, a.m., that's gonna run until 8 a.m. If we start another shift at 4 a.m., that's gonna run till 12, 12 p.m., start at 8, runs to four o'clock, we start at 12, runs to eight, we start at four, runs to midnight, we start at eight, it runs until four a.m. So assuming that we can start the shift at these uh, those cutting periods, four hour periods, these are all the possible shifts that we can create, eight hour shift. And the eight hour is important 
because we know that after eight hours, the bus has to go to maintenance. So we complete the shift, we send the bus to, to maintenance. Um, so we have six decision variables that are associated with the start times of those shifts. So X1 is the number of buses that we want started at 12.01 a.m. X2, the number of buses starting at 4.01 a.m. X3, 12, X4, um, sorry, X3, 8, X4, 12, X5, 4, and X6, 8 p.m. Okay. You see that um, after you create this picture, formulation of the decision variables um, became or become clear. So now we want to minimize the total number of buses in operation. So we want to minimize the summation of the number of buses that we're starting at each shift. So we have the summation of X1 plus X2 plus X3 plus X4. Minimizing the number of buses will give you the minimum number of buses that you need to meet the, the required uh, demand. Okay, so constraints. Because of the overlapping of the shifts, the number of buses for the successive four hour periods can be computed as follows. So if we go back to the, um, the other picture, let me show you that here. You know that from 12 to 4 a.m., the, the shifts that are going to be available here are X1 and X6. So if you're going to cover that four time period, four hour time period, you are going to cover with the buses that started at 12 a.m. and the buses that started at 8 p.m. that are running until 8 a, uh, 4 a.m. in the morning. Okay, so the summation of these two groups of buses will give you the number of buses that you have within that time period. And we, we want four, okay? So whatever your schedule between these two have to meet that need. Same thing if you look, let's say another time period here, this time period from 12 to 4 a.m. The buses that are running there are the ones that started at eight and the ones that are started at noon. So if you want to meet that requirement of seven, it has to be met by those buses that started at eight and the buses that are starting at that time period. And that process is repeated for four hours. So if you go from four to eight, the requirement is gonna be met by X1 and X2. And that's how the constraints are formulated. If you look at this, the number of buses in operation from 12 to 4 a.m. are X1 plus X6. You go there, you can see that here. Buses that started at 12, buses that started at uh, 8 o'clock p.m. The summation of the two are the ones that are going to be looking at that four time, four hour time period, 12 to 4 a.m. And the same thing for 4 to 8 a.m., X1 plus X2. So we have the combinations for each four hour time period. And using that information, then we can formulate the constraints. So that's what we have on the right here, X1 plus X6, number of buses that you want during that time period has to be that demand, which is here. That has to be at least four. You need at least four buses during that time period. You need at least eight, eight buses during that time period, which is X1 plus X2, the buses that are going to be serving that time. Same thing for here, 10, X2 plus X3, 7, X3 plus X4, and this one is 12, and then the last one, 4, is X5 plus X6. And these are my constraints. 
So the formulation at the end has um, the minimization of the number of buses, all the buses for each eight hour shift, subject to these constraints. And the bounds are listed here. Questions about this one? With, yes. The, the question is, okay, so we, we are trying to minimize the number of buses that we need for, for the day, and we have the bounds, the minimum, right? How, however, even though we have the bounds for the minimum, we don't know what will be the best combination of buses starting at 12, buses starting at 8, buses starting at 12 p.m., and that's what the problem is, is trying to, to get you. Uh, you know that you need four, but would that be met by having only buses starting uh, eight o'clock at night? Or do you need any buses starting at 12 a.m.? So that's what the problem is gonna tell you because again, those shifts are overlapping. So depending on the need, depending on the availability, the solution is going to be looking at the different combinations and telling you, okay, if you wanna have the minimum number of buses, this is the best combination. And then we have another problem. This is the last one we're gonna discuss. I think we're gonna leave the, the lab for, for Wednesday. Um, post office report a different number of full-time employees on different days of the week. So again, similar type of problem, different application. Um, the union rules state that each full-time employee must, uh, must work, I'm sorry, five consecutive days and then have two days off. Okay, so if you're an employee, you want to set up your schedule, you wanna work five days in a row and then have two days uh, off. Post office wants to meet its daily requirement by using only full-time employees. Okay, and we have the information about the number of employees that are required per day, Mondays through Sunday. 17, 13, 15, 19, 14, 16, and 11. Okay, so we want to formulate an LP that the post office can use to minimize the number of full-time employees that must be higher. So instead of looking at the four hour time period now to meet the eight hour, we're gonna look at seven days. We want to meet five in a row. So same type of problem, different application. So what are the questions to be answered? How many employees to begin to work on each day? And we're gonna use I to represent the date of the week. Decision variables, X I equals the number of employees beginning work on day I. Okay, so seven days, I will represent, I equals one to represent Sunday, I equals two represents Monday, Tuesdays, and, and so on. And then the decision variable is gonna tell me Okay, these many employees are gonna start working on Monday. So we, we meet the, the needs for the, for the office and we also meet the requirement of working five days in a row and two days off. So the objective function is to minimize the total number of employees. So the number of full-time employees equals the number of employees who start to work on Monday plus the number of uh, employees work on Tuesday until Sunday. So our objective function is to minimize that summation. If you remember the previous problem is exactly the same objective function. Um, we are summing the number of entities that are starting at a specific time period. Okay, so the constraints, the post office must ensure that enough employees are working every day. So who's working on Monday? Okay, so again, if we look at the, see if I can draw that here. So if I start on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, 
And then this is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So if I start on Monday, I'm working Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then I have Saturday and Sundays off. If I start on Tuesday, I work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And I have Sunday and Monday off. Start on Wednesday, I work this, 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 and this. And I have Mondays and Tuesdays off, right? Let's see. They do Sundays. So you see the process. So if I start on Thursday, work these three days, and then I have Tuesday and Wednesday off. And if you continue that process, Friday, three days here, and then I have Wednesdays and Thursdays off. And if I start on Saturday, I work these days and I have Thursdays and Fridays off. If I start on Sunday, I work these days and I have Fridays and Saturdays off. So who's working on Monday? If you look at Mondays, these are the people who are working on Monday. Okay, so the people who started on Sunday, People who started on Monday, the people who started on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday are the ones that are working on Monday. People that started on Tuesday are not working on Mondays. People that work that started on Wednesday, they are not working on Mondays. So if you go to the definition of this constraint, Monday, we want to have at least 17. And we are going to know how many we need based on the shifts. So if we assume that this is x1, I guess, yes? Yes, Monday is x1, this is x2, three, four, five, six, and seven. The summation of x1, which is the people who started on Monday plus x4, the people who started on Thursday, X5, people started on Friday. X6, people started on, on Saturday. And X7, people started on Sunday. They have to be greater or equal to 17. See, when, when we started this lecture, we started thinking about the shares, the move, the practice that you need to. So the challenge here is to see this. Once you see this, formulation is simple. So the challenge is how, how do you organize this information in a way that makes sense so you can formulate the, the constraints? Um, so once you get this table, constraints are simple because you just go through each column now and you can formulate the constraints for each day. So we did the constraint for Monday. We can do Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in the same way which is what we have here. Um, adding similar constraints for the other six days, this is what we end up with. And the formulation, you have the objective function, you make the bounds greater or equal to zero, and that's your formulation. It's all, I mean, we're gonna revisit this when we start solving the problems in the computer. We're gonna go through each one of them and we're gonna see, oh, makes sense now, this is the best solution, uh, and so on. Um, so I'm gonna stop here again. The lab is open, I'm gonna close it and we're gonna start with that next uh, on Wednesday. Is go back, review this. There's an assignment uh, that is open starting today. Just look at the assignment. And for those who were not here at the beginning, in two weeks, we're gonna have our first exam. 
Okay, so the plan is to complete this lecture. We're gonna start lecture four, and that will be the material for the first exam. Um, the first exam is gonna be on September 27th. We're gonna have a review on Wednesday, uh, the, day we, the, the week before the exam. Uh, so you will have an opportunity to ask questions and, um, and then I'm gonna talk about the format of the exam on that Wednesday. And on Monday, September the 27th, you're gonna have your first exam in class. So for those of you who are, are connected, the exam is going to be in class. So make sure that you plan to come to the university, uh, to the classroom. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here and we'll talk again on Wednesday. Can you change the exam chapter four or lecture four? Lecture four, until lecture four. So we're gonna come lecture four, yes. In class. In class.